Thank you so much for the organizers of the Global Security Forum for allowing myself and my fellow cadets to participate in this event. Um, we're super thankful for that. I'd also be remiss if I didn't thank Mr. Bill Murdy for helping the Social Sciences Department resource this event, uh, this trip for us, and also West Point for letting us actually leave its gates, kind of a, a rare occurrence these days. Um, so I have the, the privilege of interviewing the Honorable Ryan McCarthy, the 24th Secretary of the Army. Um, prior to being confirmed as the Undersecretary of the Army, uh, Secretary McCarthy worked at Lockheed Martin Corporation in various vice presidential roles and also served as the special assistant to the 22nd Secretary of Defense, Robert Gates, uh, under Presidents Bush and Obama. Um, but finally and most importantly, Secretary McCarthy served as an infantry platoon leader in the 75th Ranger Regiment as part of Operation Enduring Freedom in Afghanistan. So, sir, thank you so much for being here with us this morning, or this afternoon, in person. Good to be here, Henry. And Henry's on a similar track as a guy named Mark Esper, who was a, a co-captain of the Sandhurst team at West Point as well. So you got a bright future, Henry. <laughs> Hopefully, sir. I appreciate that. Um, so jumping right in, uh, I wanted to address how the Army's role in competing for the future uh, will change as we move into great power competition. So what will, great, uh, what will ground conflict look like in this emerging era of great power competition, and how can Army leadership adapt the force to prepare for this shift? So uh, when you kind of look at conflict, the nature will be the same, violent, uncertain, but the conduct is getting faster. When you look at great power uh, adversaries and we'd say great power competition, it's not conflict. How do we compete against China, Russia, North Korea, Iran? Part of the challenge is technology. Part of the challenge is terrain. Are we postured in the right places around the world. Uh, and over the last, really, at the, towards the end of the Obama administration and through uh, the, the Trump administration, the United States military started conducting more operations in East Asia, Thailand, Indonesia, the Philippines. U.S. Army is actually conducting operations in Palau for the first time. They did it for the first time in 37 years back in 2018. So much of the challenge is advise and assist our allies foreign military sales, intelligence sharing, strengthening those partnerships across the intergovernmental solutions. So it's not just the military. We have to help them in the intelligence community. We have to help them economically. Uh, so these intergovernmental solutions are really how we're going to continue to maintain um, deterrence for decades to come. Thank you, sir. Um, okay, so as we talk about this increasingly uncertain future, um, the, the common theme of you know, complexity arises. And in the global war on terror, what we saw was special operation forces being implied uh, in a variety of roles outside of their traditional mission set. Um, so how do you expect the mission set of SOFT to shift for future conflicts? And how can we adapt for these future conflicts without losing the skills and lessons from the last 20 years of war? So I think what you're referring to is the direct action capabilities of like the Ranger Regiment or the Navy SEALs, where Green Berets historically had been advised and assist these uh, the indigenous forces of other countries, they started doing more direct action and changing a little bit of the culture of those organizations by doing more direct action and prosecuting targets of high value terrorist entities. They've got to revert back to that DNA of when they started back in the 60s under the Kennedy administration, where they would go around the world and advise and assist partner nations. So there's a lot of that that has to be done. There's also intelligence gathering and early warning, understanding what are these operations like the Zapad exercise in Eastern Russia, or Western, what they do in Western Russia along the border of Poland. We have to know more about what the, the intentions are of other nations. And we have to be in places where we can help support, whether it's NATO partners or Eastern Europe. So they're in a the bit of a transition, but that takes time. You know, you have the Green Berets were deployed at a minimum of a battalion size element for 20 straight years. So if you think about that, that organization, along with the Ranger Regiment and the Special Mission Units, had at a minimum of a battalion plus size element deployed every single day for 20 years. They've made a shift. And the, the experience set 
and the mentality of the leaders are used to four or five combat tours doing direct action operations. So this is a big shift for the Department of Defense, definitely for the Army. I won't, won't speak for the other services. Um, well, I can't really speak for the Army anymore either. Oh, old habits. But uh, you, you have to realize that it's a, they're all people organizations at the end of the day. And they're, you're a creature of your experience. So it's, it's a big behavioral shift. And they're gonna have, they've made changes in how they're training and the types of technologies they're pursuing uh, to continue to give them that margin that they need in the event of, of a kinetic conflict. Um, but it's gonna, be a, it's gonna be a challenge, for sure. Thank you, sir. Um, so kind of speaking about these different challenges, uh, particularly in kind of new domains, um, like due to the Army operating in new and in irregular domains, a multi-domain environment, does the training of young officers and NCOs need to change? Um, if so, how? And what can the Army do to ensure it's retaining the most talented of these young leaders? So uh, if you look at where the, the Army in particular was trying to go in the last decade, uh, greater emphasis in really the last five or six years is having artificial intelligence software in our weapon systems. And the reason why you need artificial intelligence is even though we have a lot of smart West Pointers like Henry and all of his classmates here, they can't crunch data faster than a machine. So I'll give you an example. Close air support, infantry unit in contact. And they got rounds coming in at them and they want to call for fire. It takes about 20 minutes, there's my friend, General Bruce Crawford, trying to, uh, but uh, it, it takes them about 20 minutes to clear fires. 20 minutes while you're in a firefight. It was like that 20 years ago and it's like that now. Because the human beings are looking at the geometry and they're putting the math together. What's the asset that you have to bring in to drop a JDAM on an enemy position? But a machine, that has the algorithm can punch it out. There's an Apache in the air tasking order. It's outfitted with these capabilities. It's like a trade on Wall Street. I want to sell a barrel of oil for $80 on the Hang Seng. Boop, half a second, maybe faster. Why can't we do that in a joint operations center when a unit's in contact to bring an asset in to drop ordnance and prosecute an enemy target? That's where you see the energy in the Department of Defense. You hear Department of Defense leaders talking about artificial intelligence. They need to have that capability. We'll still have a human in the loop. Their leader in the jock will say, drop it. They'll communicate with the leader on the ground who's in contact. Whoever gets there first is going to be faster on the battlefield. And speed is everything in combat. Whoever hits first is more likely to win. And that's where you're going to see a lot of that. So what do you need to do? Artificial intelligence is what? Computer science, math. STEM talent is essential for where all the institutions are going because the weapon systems are getting more sophisticated. So the engineering talent is incredibly important. The Army created an organization, Army Futures Command, just so that we can try to get more software talent in the Army, so we can have a place where we can communicate to academia and business more effectively. They're in the middle of a city in a high rise, and they, they're dressed like this. There's no fences or tanks and flags in front of the buildings, and you have to get access to the post. We're in a city talking to entrepreneurs to, on the campuses of the University of Texas, Texas A&M, Cal Berkeley, and have this network to try to get more of our men and women into those types of disciplines, whether they're graduate programs or software development education, because you'll need them when you're negotiating a multi-billion dollar deal with a defense company, and you'll also need them in the jock of the 82nd Airborne Division when a unit's in contact. And you're gonna have somebody there that can crunch the math very quickly Here's an Apache, here's an F-18, here's a, and you just stack and rack your options for the commander, and they make the decision in seconds. Because lives will matter, and it's only gonna get harder. Gotcha, sir. Um, and with the importance of, of these K-12 
capabilities uh, and, and skills brought by those capable in, in STEM fields. Um, how do you feel like the Army could do a better job of retaining good leaders? I know it's been a problem recently. So this is a place that General McConville um, has done a, a really great job, but it has been a labor of love for him. This has really started when he was the G1 of the Army, incredibly important job, and um, he's really pushed on a talent management system so they can provide options. You know, the, the army that General Crawford was in was, here's your bus ticket and you're going to Fort Bragg tomorrow. And he would smile and he'd run and catch the bus on time. Today, you have options. And we fight to keep the talent so that you can give them options of where they want to be stationed, what they want to do professionally, so that they're not forced into an outcome that says, you know, I have options on the other side. You're, you're going to be a West Point graduate soon. You can probably go to any graduate school in the country in, when you're done in five years with your tour, your, your initial uh, tour in the Army. So the Army is going to have to fight to keep you. And they put the policies and they've invested in systems so that you can have those options and you can have the career and chase the career that you want to reach your maximum potential. Gotcha, sir. Um, so I, I kind of like to transition to this great power competition with China. Um, and as we know, like rising China poses a, a threat to US interests around the world. Um, and curbing Chinese aggression requires a unified effort uh, between aligned allies. Um, but after our recent withdrawal with Afghanistan, we've seen some tension among our allies, uh, additionally with the submarine deal with Australia and the UK. Um, so how is Army leadership working to strengthen relationships between the US and our foreign allies? And um, how, can Army, how can the Army work to better align our allies' strategic interests with those of the United States? So the Army has always done very well at this. Uh, I, there was an example that I mentioned earlier today when I was uh, talking to the cadets. If you, if you look at back at when Arab Spring began over a decade ago, really started in Tunisia and it went across like wildfire across northern Africa into Egypt, What's held the Egyptian to get government together, albeit by their fingertips, were the institutions that they built, and largely built with the U.S. Army and the U.S. Air Force. In 1979, at the Camp David Accords, a large FMS foreign military sales deal where we sell them tanks and, we, and uh, F-16s, and had an advise and assist relationship with them for over 40 years. If you go back and look at anybody that wrote a book about that time, it was George Casey, the Chief of Staff of the Army, Secretary Army Pete Garrett and others, Army leaders communicating with them about how to work with their population, about the disagreements they had about how they were running the country. This is when President Hosni Mubarak's government fell. And you had a lot of religion and you had a lot of other factors that were driving the people to want to change in the government. But they kept it together because they had these institutions that they grew over time. We had 40 straight years of advise and assist with these countries, that country in particular. Uh, so we do a lot of that around the world. So it's advise and assist, it's foreign military sales, and it's officer exchanges. One of the best programs that, that we have and that the Army is very proud of is they have them come over there. Some of them might be cadets in your class. They go to our professional military educational programs, whether as the infantry school at Fort Benning or Fort Leavenworth, at the, um, where our field grades go uh, for their, uh, their professional military education, and ultimately the War College. And it's those relationships over time, they're gonna obviously send their best people to the United States, and they become leaders. I mean, how often I would go to meetings and General McConville would sit across from somebody, they went to the work college together. They went to Fort Leavenworth together. And he had, he had relationships that lasted decades. And in particular, for people like Millie or McConville, they have two decades of combat operations with NATO allies. Just from my own example, the Chief of the General Staff, Mark Carlton Smith in, in the UK, he was with 22 SAS with me 20 years ago when I was in the Ranger Regiment. Right? I stay at his house when I visit the United Kingdom. Uh, so relationships are always critically important. Policy decisions between administrations, they're going to be made. Good, bad, or indifferent. I work for Republicans and Democrats. They're going to make decisions that might go well and they might not go well. 
the institution creates people like you. And you're going to grow up with these other officers and during challenges politically between countries, that's what holds it together. So there'll be good times and there'll be tough times too. But tough times don't last, tough people do. And that's why we got all these cadets and midshipmen in here. Thank you, sir. Um, and, and kind of building on that, uh, focusing on the cyber domain. Um, so there's been a lot of discussion regarding the use of, of cyber capabilities. And we've seen some integration and cooperation among Western nations. Um, but how can the West, NATO in particular, do a better job of, of integrating their cyber capabilities uh, to project against China and Russia? That's very challenging. Uh, the, if you look at how hard it is just to share intelligence between other nations, how hard it is for us to just share secret level um, information with a NATO ally. It's agonizingly difficult to get through the process because based off the relationship with country X or Y, you'll share information. So then when you, when you bring the systems together, you create more vulnerabilities. So endpoint security is a huge challenge for us in the cyber domain. America has the smartest people. We have the greatest entrepreneurs, but we have more of a disconnected system than anybody. We have thousands, hundreds of thousands of endpoints that you ultimately have to defend. And the challenge with, the, with that becomes very expensive. And then, and then from a policy standpoint, it's all about speed in the cyber domain. You can't wait to have a principles committee meeting in the White House and bring everybody together and they sit in the sit room and make a decision about doing something. It has to be much more dynamic. So it's as much a policy choice as it is a technical challenge for us to, to integrate or synchronize cyber capabilities, coupled with the fact of a policy choice. If another nation interferes in the United States and disrupts an election or tries to interfere with an election, or if they try to steal things from our intellectual property from our systems, is that an act of war? You know, America has to really define what war means in the cyber domain. And this has been going on for much more energy over the last decade, and you've had three different presidents since then. And they've all been challenged with what is truly an act of war in that domain. Thank you, sir. Um, these have all been very insightful answers. I, I'd like to finish with one last question sure. on um, kind of advice for both the cadets here, uh, future military leaders, and then also just in the civilian, civilian side, um, kind of leading in this 21st century, particularly in the security domain. Uh, do you have any advice for us? Okay, so I told these cadets this before. So now for my future airmen and sailors over here, be decisive. Uh, I told the story to these cadets a little bit earlier when young Ryan McCarthy got the first lesson about how uh, hedging is not a real strategy as a leader. I was eight years old and I'm a Catholic, so in the Catholic church you kneel in the, on the pews. So I, had, I was kneeling and I was kind of leaning back and I had my um, backside against the, chair, uh, against the pew and my father leans over and he says, sit or kneel, don't do both, because he's watching and so am I. And uh, that was a lesson for me, own a decision. Don't do both. You're gonna make good ones, you're gonna make bad ones. Your soldiers, your sailors, your airmen are gonna follow you, or your Marines, I don't think you're gonna be a Marine though, right? But uh, uh, they're gonna follow you because you're decisive. You will inspire them. Know the fundamentals of your business. Officers, written verbal communication. Transcending the intent of the commander into action. That's your job. And relationships. Know your soldiers, your airmen, your sailors. Know their families. Because you've got to take care of them. You have to help enable them to reach their potential. You do all that, you're going to be great. You'll all be like McConville and Gilday and CQ Brown. You'll all be great. Well, thank you very much for that advice, okay. sir. We're done? I think that's all the time we okay. have. So a round of applause. Hey, thanks, everybody. Martin, please. Thank you very much. Good job. Thank you. Thank you.